and I invite you to partake on an exciting educational journey related to public health theory, practice, and research. You shall discover on this learning adventure that the art and science of public health is inter- and multidisciplinary in nature, very complex and broad, and continuously evolving over time. In this lecture, a fundamental understanding of major qualitative, quantitative, and mixed study research design and approaches will be examined. These are critical for evidence-informed decision-making and practice in public health. Now let's begin our learning adventure. So let's begin our journey by actually defining what is research. So research is defined as a systematic and purposeful method of scientific inquiry into the nature of phenomena of interest to public healthcare professionals and scientists in an attempt to develop new knowledge and practice standards, test existing hypotheses, and to develop conceptual models and theories. The critical role of research in public health. Well, public health is actually defined as a holistic and evidence-informed discipline that seeks to promote, maintain, and or restore the health and quality of life of individuals, families, communities, and or entire populations over the lifespan through health promotion and prevention and various primary health care initiatives, activities, policies, and or legislations. So what is evidence-informed public health? Well, this is really defined as a process for distilling and disseminating the best available evidence from research, practice, and experience and using that evidence to inform and improve public health policy and practice. So as you can see, research is really fundamental to the practice of public health. So where does public health research take place? Well, it can take place in a variety of settings, including laboratories, it can take place in school settings. It can take place in long-term care facilities, in community clinics. It could also take place in workplaces and also online, such as internet-based uh, sites, to name but a few locations. So here we see a photo of some research uh, related to um, my microbial resistance taking place on the left in the lab. And conversely, on the right, you actually see a mobile scientific research team. And I shot uh, this uh, van actually uh, in, uh, when I was in Japan traveling about. Why is research important to the practice of public health? Well, as public health care professionals and workers, you will be required to integrate data and research findings into your practice on a daily basis you will be required to critically appraise research reports, identify and implement safe and effective primary health care interventions for public health practice as well. So for example, if you're interested in designing a public health cyber bullying prevention awareness website, you would have to do an examination of the existing empirical and gray literatures related to this topic and see how best to address this growing uh, public health concern. So why is research important for the practice of public health? Well, research is also needed to generate knowledge about public health education, how it is administered, and also the cost effectiveness and return on investment or ROI for healthcare services administered across the lifespan. So here's a classic example of a primary uh, intervention. And this is the annual flu shots. So we know as a fact that for every dollar spent on immunization, 
This results in a $16 return on investment or 1500%. What is basic research? Well, basic research is defined as activities undertaken to extend the base of knowledge to public health or to formulate and or refine an existing conceptual model or theory. So for example, we know that approximately 75% of currently re-emerging and newly emerging infectious diseases globally are zoonotic in, in, in nature, meaning that they come from animal sources and eventually affect humans. So we know bats, for example, are suspected as the zoonotic source for both SARS and also COVID-19. What is the purpose of basic research? Well, it's to solve problems, to make decisions related to healthcare delivery or services, and to predict or control outcomes in practice situations. For example, research has shown that poverty, access to clean drinking water supplies, and proper treatment of sewage are major social determinants of health across the lifespan. Over here on the right, you see a photo of a squatter's home that I took in Hong Kong. And this particular squatter's home was built over an open sewer uh, here that you can see in this picture, the, uh, the, this, this shack was approximately uh, 10 feet by 8 feet. And inside, when you went inside, there was a, a hole in the ground and uh, where all the feces and urine and so forth would go into that open sewer. But of course, this individual was living in poverty, which is a major social determinant of health and was also exposed to uh, these living conditions, living over an open sewer, which is obviously not ideal. What is applied research? It's defined as public health interventions that focus on finding solutions to existing problems and to generate knowledge that will directly influence practice. For example, proper lifting techniques to prevent injury or harm in workplaces and homes. Uh, so we have to teach healthcare professionals how to properly lift or to assist patients, for example, due to mobility issues and also in homes. So on the top here, you see an incorrect technique where this uh, individual is lifting a heavy box uh, using his back muscles where the correct technique shown here to lift that heavy box would be to bend your knees and lift with your legs. What is quantitative research? Well, it's defined as a formal, precise, systematic, and objective process in which numerical data are used to obtain information on a variety of health-related phenomena of interest or concern. So it might be the role of hypertension in the development of various forms of cardiovascular disease, including the stroke acute and having acute myocardial infarcts, for example. So that measurement of one's blood pressure, and if we know if you have hypertension, this of course increases your risks for developing various forms of cardiovascular disease. So these are numbers we can look at and analyze. Quantitative data analysis, uh, here the researcher uses basically statistical procedures to organize, interpret, and communicate numerical data in a meaningful way. Findings are typically summarized in the form of tables and graphs and other pictorial representations. Uh, for example, here on the right, we see a pie chart depicting major causes of mortality Globally, we see cardiovascular disease, for example, at a little over 33%, cancer is at 15%. So this provides a pictorial representation of the breakdown of major causes of disease uh, globally in the form of a pie chart. 
Quantitative data analysis makes it possible to obtain reasonably precise and object, uh, objective info, uh, information based on explicit rules and conditions for performing a variety of descriptive and inferential statistical procedures. And this is based on the classification or level of numerical measurement performed, which I will show you on a subsequent slide. So descriptive statistics basically describe the data, data sets here, right? Provide summary data information. Typical examples are mean, medium, mode, percentages, standard deviation, and ranges. Inferential statistics uh, attempt to generalize from the sample to your target population. It involves hypothesis testing and making predictions, and examples include things like ANOVA, t-test, and chi-square would be examples of some inferential statistical procedures. The, here we see a table depicting the four levels of quantitative measurement. And each level of measurement, running from nominal all the way up to ratio, has a different set of statistical procedures that can be used for each. Uh, uh, nominal is the lowest level of measurement. It basically uh, involves the assignment of characteristics into a mutually exclusive and collective exhaustive categories. Numbers in this category do not have meaningful, uh, do not really mean anything per se. Uh, examples would be, let's say, sex, or male or female, blood types, uh, marital status, where you would uh, indicate married as one, separated or divorced as two, widowed as three, not married as four. These, these would be examples of that numerical. So hence, one is not greater than four. It is simply a, a way of organizing data for this nominal category. Ordinal rank data, these ones have defined criterion, which captures information about equivalence and its relative rank. However, they do not inform us about how much greater one rank or category is in comparison to the other. So let's take, for example, the frequency of visits of a family caregiver uh, to a long-term care facility in the community ranked from low as one daily, several times a week, several times a month as three or four as rarely. Interval data, this is a specified rank ordering on a defined attribute and the distance between those R objects are assumed to be equivalent in nature along this continuum. However, there is no true or absolute zero using this interval scale. So examples here are things like temperature, of course, that can go minus and so forth, if you think of the thermometer. Various psychometric scales uh, as well are, are classical examples here. Ratio is the highest level of measurement um, about the ordering. It has an exact ma magnitude we can determine between the various levels because there is a clearly defined true zero. Um, so daily calorie consumption, you could have anywhere from zero to let's say 2,500 calories per day. Uh, weight, height, lipid biomarkers, physical activity duration uh, per day, right? The, these are classical examples of ratio level data. What is qualitative research? Well, qualitative research um, is defined as a holistic and subjective process used to describe and to promote a better understanding of human experiences and phenomena via the collection of narrative data and to develop conceptual models and theories that seek to describe these experiences and phenomena. So it might be, for example, the perceptions of clients who use telehealth services and rural, in rural, living in rural and remote uh, parts of Canada. Analysis of qualitative data is a, dy is a dynamic, intuitive, very cerebral and creative process that is more fluid in nature due to its holistic nature in comparison to the more linear 
and formulaic nature of quantitative data analysis. In fact, the researcher is the instrument here. They don't have any measuring rulers. They don't have any scales. The researcher needs to engage in that critical and creative process for analyzing the data. So how is this accomplished? So here's a pictorial representation. So the first step involves transcribing and coding the data. And this is represented by various colors of candy here in photo A. This is sort of a pictorial representation I wanted to show you to give you an idea about this creative and intuitive process. So all of these different color candies in photo A represent different statements, narrative data that it has been uh, co uh, transcribed. In photo B, the process of data analysis then often takes the form of data clusters which are comprised of specific data sets with similar themes represented by the sorting of candies by specific color codes here. So you may, in other words, sort uh, the data in, into these various clusters based on certain themes that are arising, certain narrations that have come up from your data set. It may be related to one's quality of life, it may be related to pain, discomfort. It may be related to patient care satisfaction. These, are, these would be examples of how you would actually cluster these data into these different uh, sets. So let's do a comparison just briefly here between qualitative and quantitative research. I'm not going to go through the entire chart. I'm just gonna highlight a few uh, examples here. So we know that qualitative data is very subjective in nature. Whereas quantitative data, it's, it's very objective in, in, in nature. It's, it's measurable, it's, it's tangible, right? With qualitative research, a very important point here is that the researcher is the instrument and seeks to build close personal relationships with the subjects for data collection. There's, um, the quantitative data, while well, the researcher is typically at arm's length, separate or detached from subjects during data collection. They want to be at arm's length. We sometimes run single blinded or even double blinded clinical trials, for example, uh, just to be at arm's length to make the uh, data more objective. With the qualitative, the whole is greater than the parts. And with quantitative, the parts equal the whole, okay? In uh, qualitative, data analysis is inductive, constant, and ongoing. And data analysis with quantitative is deductive in nature, right? So there are just some of the, 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 the comparisons between qualitative and quantitative. We also have something called a mixed methods research design. And this has really grown in both acceptance and popularity over the past 20 years. And the mixed methods consist of a blending, or you can think of it as a hybrid, of both qualitative and quantitative approaches and methods. These mixed method, methods research designs are continue, continually evolving in scope and application. And they can be employed to gather a variety of information in the public and allied health sciences. The data, in my opinion, are often richer because you're combining two research methodologies, both qualitative and quantitative components. So the outcomes of the study and the understanding of those various concepts are very rich indeed. What is a research question? Well, a research question is defined as a clear statement of scientific inquiry that the investigator wants to answer through a specific study. Okay. Formulation of a research question involves a creative process which draws upon consideration of previous relevant work in the area or field of inquiry. It could also come from clinical practice and or emerging public health issues or concerns. Uh, examples would include obesity, 
and immobility trends that are happening here in North America, aging population, and the development of various non-communicable chronic disease rates are increasing, the COVID-19 pandemic, etc. Research questions are employed by both qualitative and quantitative researchers. What is, I, what is a hypothesis? This is defined as a prediction statement made by the researcher regarding the expected relationships between two or more variables. In fact, a, an hypothesis uh, is regarded as a micro theory. There are variables, well, a variable is defined, uh, is a defined attribute of a person or object that varies and or takes on different values. This could be things like age, of course, increases over time, the heart rate, your income level, uh, your staging of cancer, your occupation, level of education obtained, or your exposure dose to pesticides in the environment over time. These are just some examples here of a variable, okay? Now, hypothesis, because it involves predictions, um, are only utilized by quantitative researchers. They are not obviously utilized by qualitative researchers. However, research questions, as I noted before, are employed by both. Here's an example of a hypothesis. Suppose we wanted to investigate a study looking at the benefits of Tai Chi. So one of the hypotheses might read as, like, as, as, as such. Older adults with rheumatoid arthritis who engage in Tai Chi exercises at least three times weekly for 30 minutes each session will report increased quality of life and decreased pain and discomfort in comparison to sedentary controls with rheumatoid arthritis. All right, so we're making a prediction here about the benefits of Tai Chi in, in terms of pain and dis discomfort and quality of life measures. And also we're using a comparison group here, right? And, and this will be, of course, the data will be collected and analyzed using various statistical procedures. What is the research process? Well, the research process is defined as a series of nine major steps and techniques used to structure a study and to gather, analyze, interpret, disseminate, and apply data and information in a systematic and formalized fashion. Here's a quick overview of the nine major steps of the research process. You see it here in this diagram. And we will examine each step in the subsequent slides in more details. The step one involves the identification of a problem. It is also referred to as the conceptualization phase. So here, the first step of the research process involves the identification of an actual or potential public health concern, issue, or challenge. And personal interest or curiosity often serves as the impetus for this step. So for example, you might be interested in examining the long-term health effects associated with vaping in youth. Step two involves review of the literature. So this step involves determining what, if anything, is already known about your research problem by reviewing the best available scientific and gray literature. Now, the scientific literature often involves published literature, empirical literature, right? Peer-reviewed literature, we think of it. And gray literature involves things like best practice guidelines or, or policies or, 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 or sort of websites that are credible, such as the Center for Disease Control, the Public Health Agency of Canada, the WHO, or other government sort of websites uh, giving directions here and, and uh, sort of guidelines for public health professionals. And 
A thorough review of the empirical and gray literature also provides the researcher with a foundation on which to base new evidence and formulate either new research questions and or hypotheses. Um, over here, so we've really gone over the years from manual-based to computer-based researchers. I remember in the late 70s and early 80s uh, spending, uh, you know, uh, weeks in the library doing research, uh, looking at books and published articles and so forth. And I can accomplish this today using various electronic databases. Uh, what I could do in a week, for example, I can probably do in half an hour now by comparison. And over here in this photo, we see uh, one of the first uh, computers, uh, Freddie Williams and Tom uh, Kilburn built the first computer. Uh, which they nicknamed Baby in 1974, that could run a stored program at the University of Manchester in England before computers were considered coal terminals and you always had to input the data. So this was really the, the first uh, computer that could run a stored program. Today, a variety of internet-based electronic databases that store millions of health-related abstracts, and links to peer-reviewed journals are available to public health professionals, students, researchers, and the general public globally as well. Here are some examples. There are a variety of them. Uh, uh, CINAHL, Cumulative Index to Nursing and Health Literature, uh, Medline, uh, Medical Literature Online, PsycInfo, and so forth. There is also a variety of government-based websites as, as well, such as the Public Health Agency of Canada, the CDC, the WHO. Uh, these are examples as well where you can access various reports. Step four involves designing a study. So a research design is a detailed plan or blueprint for the research methods and strategies that will be employed by the researcher in order to answer the research question or hypothesis. We're going to... All right, so here on the right, you see a photo of a cute little robot. Uh, so actually, uh, myself and some colleagues at uh, Ontario Tech University in Oshawa, Ontario, and Ontario Shore Center for Mental Health Sciences, and with the Ontario, uh, we designed this uh, descriptive study uh, to look at the use of assistive robots with artificial intelligence uh, to help manage BPSDs or behavioral and psychological symptoms associated with dementia in, 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 in patients in long-term care facilities. So these robots will learn to identify these BPSDs such as aggression, agitation, having hallucinations and so forth. And they will tailor uh, uh, their interventions uh, for each patient uniquely. They will learn uh, to identify these BPSDs using the AI and, and also which is the most appropriate intervention for that particular um, noted a BPSD or trigger for that BPSD. It may use, for example, reminiscent therapy. It could tell a joke used for distraction. It can use personal musical uh, music interventions or PMIs or it may have to notify the nurse uh, when required. The fifth involves getting ethical approval for your study. So in the public health sciences, like all disciplines that involve research with humans or animals, investigators must, must address a range of ethical issues before the study can be formally approved by their institution. It could be a hospital, community clinic, university, etc. So various codes of ethics involve a defined set of ethical standards that need protection, including the respect for human dignity, the right to privacy, and, and make sure that all the data collected are, are in fact confidential or coded. There's no identifiers there. Uh, Self-determination and full disclosure of the potential benefits and risks associated with the study. You have to get informed consent and the right to withdraw from the study anytime without penalties. 
Step six involves the collection of data. So quantitative researchers collect data employing highly structured and predetermined data collection plans and protocols. They may utilize, for example, a wound healing scale. Uh, they may be measuring the length of the incision or various pain scales, like the McGill pain scale, for example, for assessing, uh, for assessing that wound. Data analysis, step seven, the analytical phase. The main objective of data analysis, regardless of the type of data collected, be it quantitative or qualitative, is to formally organize and structure the data so that the researcher can extrapolate the meaning of the data in terms of the research question posed and or hypothesis stated. Step eight of the research process involves determining the strengths and limitations of the study. The reader should critique all published research studies and reports for their overall quality, completeness, and significance for evidence-informed public health. This requires that the reader carefully examine the research problem, its stated aim or purpose, its noted research questions or hypotheses, the design and methods employed, the actual results obtained, and the possible implications for practice. It is critical to keep in mind that there is no such thing as a perfect study. Every study has noted strengths and limitations. Step nine involves the dissemination and application of research findings. This is the final step in the research process, and it involves the dissemination and application of the research findings. Researchers who want to communicate their research findings to others can do so employing a variety of methods, including peer-reviewed journals, oral or poster presentations at national or international conferences. They can give public lectures, conduct various workshops, also contact the mass medias, such as television, radio, and newspaper, and also employ various social medias, such as Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and various scientific websites and other forums. Knowledge utilization this is a very important term. And it refers to the process of formally applying and utilizing research findings to guide public health practice, the development and evaluation of programs and public health policies and legislations as well. Hence, reading, critiquing, and synthesizing findings from the empirical and gray literature are essential for generating research evidence for news by public health care professionals and workers. Well, that's all folks. Thank you very much for listening to this lecture. And I hope that you listen to others in, in this lecture series related to public health. Cheers. <laughs>